Every once in a while, someone appears who refuses to accept the universe as it is. Someone who looks at the same sky everyone else sees and realizes the cosmos is lying to us. For centuries, the heavens were perfect, sacred, untouchable. And then one mind uncovered the pattern that cracked it all open. A discovery so strange, so mathematically impossible, it nearly destroyed him. Smallpox couldn't break him. Seminary couldn't tame him. Even the world itself seemed to push back, and he pushed harder. This is the story of Johannes Kepler, the genius who forced the universe to reveal its laws. Johannes Kepler was born in 1571 into the Holy Roman Empire, a place where plagues swept through cities, armies clashed across borders, and the line between science and superstition was razor thin. Back then, comets weren't icy rocks from deep space. They were warnings, messages. People genuinely believed the heavens were speaking to them. Kepler was a fragile kid. At three years old, smallpox nearly killed him. It scarred his face, and it damaged his eyesight permanently. Look closely, almost every portrait shows him squinting. He spent his entire life seeing the world blurry. And yet, he became the man who saw the universe most clearly. At age six, he saw a spectacular comet that terrified entire towns. But Kepler wasn't terrified. He was mesmerized. Three years later, he witnessed a lunar eclipse, one so dramatic people thought the world might end. And Kepler, he tries to measure it. This seven-year-old stands under an eclipsed moon, calculating. Meanwhile, home life is complicated. His father, Heinrich, was a mercenary soldier, gone for months or years at a time. Sometimes he returned, sometimes he didn't. Eventually, he disappeared forever. His mother, Katharina, was a herbalist, which, in a time of witch trials, is not the job you want. So Kepler grows up surrounded by poverty, instability, illness and superstition. But also, something else. This awkward, sickly kid is unbelievably smart. He starts seeing patterns everywhere. Shadows on sundials, the angles of church towers, the cycles of the moon. At 18, Kepler earns a scholarship to study here, Tübinger Stift. This was the top Lutheran seminary in the region, a place for future pastors, theologians, not astronomers. Kepler studies scripture, philosophy, languages, but also mathematics. And it's in the mathematics classroom that everything changes. His professor, Michael Meistlin, is secretly a Copernican he believes the sun, not the earth, sits at the center of the universe. Meislin quietly hands Kepler a handwritten copy of Copernicus's forbidden text. This is dangerous. The church doesn't ban it outright yet, but publicly supporting heliocentrism could ruin your career. Kepler reads it, and instantly, instantly, he's convinced. While everyone else debates doctrine, Kepler starts calculating orbits. He was supposed to become a pastor, a stable, respectable profession. But he can't stop thinking about a mathematical universe, a harmonious universe, a universe that follows laws. And as he sits in the seminary, surrounded by theology, he realizes something. Mathematics is how he understands God, not sermons, not doctrine, patterns. Kepler reaches a crossroads, faith or mathematics the pulpit, or the planets. He chooses mathematics, a choice that will pull him into the greatest astronomical revolution in history and lead him to discoveries that even Copernicus and Galileo never imagined.
When Kepler arrives in Graz at 23, he expects a stable teaching career, not a political tinderbox. He becomes a school teacher by title and the district mathematician by necessity, responsible for calendars, predictions and the astrological forecasts the public insists upon. Even though Kepler sees astrology as superstition, he reluctantly uses it to feed his growing family. But every evening, long after the classrooms fall silent, he returns to a far more ambitious pursuit, understanding the mathematical structure of the universe. One night, Kepler has a revelation so bold it nearly defies reason. He becomes convinced that God designed the cosmos using the five platonic solids, the most symmetrical shapes in geometry point. In this model, each planetary orbit fits perfectly between one solid and the next, creating a celestial architecture that is elegant, harmonious, and, in Kepler's mind, deeply divine point. The model is wrong, but it is also the spark that ignites his career. He publishes Mysterium Cosmographicum, the first mathematical defense of Copernicus ever printed, and it draws the attention of scholars across Europe point. Most dismiss it as naive, but a few, crucially the right few, take notice. Meanwhile, Kepler marries Barbara Müller, a wealthy widow with a steady social foundation. It brings some stability, but religious tensions around them escalate rapidly as the Counter-Reformation tightens its grip on Protestant communities. The Habsburg authorities begin purging Protestant teachers from Graz, and suddenly Kepler's position becomes dangerous. His classroom shrinks, his salary collapses, and Catholic authorities pressure him to convert or leave. With his career crumbling and his family threatened, he searches desperately for a way out. Kepler reaches out to a man he has never met, but whose reputation dominates the world of astronomy, Tycho Brahe, the Danish nobleman who possesses the most accurate observational data ever recorded. Kepler writes letter after letter, each one more urgent than the last, hoping Tycho might see promise in the young mathematician from Graz. Finally, an invitation arrives. Tycho wants Kepler in Prague. Tycho Brahe is unlike anyone Kepler has ever encountered. A larger-than-life nobleman with a metal nose from a duel, a private island filled with astronomical instruments the size of carriages, and a lifelong obsession with collecting the most precise data in the world. Kepler, by contrast, arrives thin, intense, financially strained, and burning with theoretical ambition. Their partnership is uneasy from the first moment. Tycho guards his data fiercely. Kepler hungers for access. Each man recognizes the other's genius, but cooperation feels as fragile as glass. And yet Tycho makes a remarkable decision. He assigns Kepler a single task, one he has failed to solve himself. Make sense of Mars, the planet whose orbit refuses to obey the perfect circular models astronomers have trusted for centuries. Before Kepler can fully begin the work, tragedy strikes. Tycho collapses after a banquet and dies within days, taking with him a lifetime of relationships, rivalries, and brilliance. But in his final hours, he makes a profound gesture. He entrusts Kepler with his observational legacy, the data that could redefine astronomy. With Tycho gone, Kepler is appointed imperial mathematician under Emperor Rudolf II, inheriting both the prestige and the crushing responsibility of completing Tycho's life's work. And at the heart of that work lies the most stubborn problem in astronomy, the bizarre, unpredictable motion of Mars. Now Kepler holds the best data in Europe, but solving Mars will require breaking the very geometry he spent his entire life believing in. If you think the journey was hard so far, part two is where the universe fights back. A planet he can't predict. A mother he might lose to fear and superstition. Two battles, one in the heavens, one on Earth. Can he decipher Mars before it destroys his work? Can he save his mother before she faces the gallows? Or will genius alone not be enough?